welcome to a new episode of Nonstop Nick Hill. It's my last day here in Mozambique, but it's not just my last day. It's the last hour or two that I have in this country before I make the easy five minute walk to the airport here in Pemba. So how did I get here to Pemba to my final stop here in Mozambique? I woke up thinking I would have to take the Shapa, but went around. I got a message from a woman that I met on one of the other bus rides on a previous day and she suggested that I try out another bus company and that they might have tickets available. And they did have plenty of departures to Pemba from Nampula and they had tickets available. We ended up leaving Nampula around 9am and making it to Pemba around 4.30. So as far as Mozambique transportation is concerned, that's actually very, very functional and uh, the bus did a great job. I did not vlog yesterday. It would have been really, really tough to vlog when I arrived, just given how rainy it was, how dark it was, and it just wasn't overall a pleasant arrival into a new city. The area that I'm staying isn't particularly attractive either. It's just a local marketplace, big, small, medium-sized vendors, uh, supermarkets, a lot of uh, small little eateries and restaurants. But yeah, other than that, I just uh, went back to the hotel around 8.30 p.m., did a little work, and then went to bed. It's just been so many early mornings here, starting at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., and then trying to sit on 10 hours of transportation that, I don't know, I, I, I just needed the sleep. But I love how it's 5 a.m. and everyone's out and about and doing something and the streets are full of people and you don't feel at all weird being up early trying to do anything here. It would be interesting to see if it's still like that in the winter, but right now we're so far south, the sun comes up so early. Even if it's 5 a.m. my alarm goes off, it's bright. I'm trying to make my way from the market area down to the sea where we can perhaps get a nice view in the morning and I can tell you a little bit more about the history of this area. So that's all what I've got planned for the next hour or two. It's all a one straight walk down the street from the airport, my place, and then the historical heart of Pemba down by the beach. Right now I'm stopped at a cafe where I can get my coffee and something to eat in the morning because I cannot operate without caffeine. <laughs> and it's been tough to get some caffeine here in Mozambique. That's one thing. If you're planning on visiting, carry an emergency stash of whatever instant coffee, tea, you need because it's really really tough to find. I don't think it's a part of the local routine here so you can only find it in more high-end European in influenced spots. So a spot like this is pretty typical of where you're gonna find your coffee and tea in the morning here in Mozambique. You don't find them on the street, you don't find them at little establishments, you don't find them anywhere that feels a bit more local or typical of the area. You have to go seek out one of these very European style cafes and then you'll find your coffee and even then it's it's not the best it's very mediocre coffee <laughs> the city of Pemba is the capital of the Cabo Delgado province of Mozambique this is a province which is fairly large and includes not only the city of Pemba and the, its surrounding areas but actually stretches all the way up to the Tanzanian border by now you must have gathered that I'm going to Tanzania next so why not travel overland there is a particular reason for why you cannot travel overland from here, Pemba, to the Tanzanian border, which is not that far away. Not too long ago, in 2017, militants linked to ISIS, the ISIS, began an offensive against Mozambican security forces and their allied security contractors just north of Pemba, here in Cabo Delgado province. Now skip forward to March of 2021. The offensive by the militants escalated and by the end of March of 2021 they were able to capture a major city in the north of Cabo Delgado province and that city is Palma. The successful capture of Palma by ISIS-linked militants meant that there was an exacerbation in the security, humanitarian and economic crises here in Cabo Delgado province. Firstly, from a security standpoint, it meant that the Mozambican security forces had another conflict on their plates. In addition to a long-standing conflict since the time of independence in the central parts of Mozambique, they now had the new Islamist insurgency in the north. This meant that they had to regroup, partner with 
sec private security contractors, as well as engage with Portugal to provide additional training and on the ground support here in Mozambique. Secondly, from a humanitarian standpoint, it meant that the city of Palma was almost completely vacated of its residents after the ISIS militants took over. The atrocities committed by the ISIS-linked militants did not end at displacing people. They killed, beheaded, and injured countless civilians during their offensive and capture and brief rule, actually, over the city of Palma. From an economic standpoint, the capture of Palma by the ISIS-linked militants dealt a major blow to an economy otherwise sustaining itself on subsistence agriculture. Keep following this beach further north and you'll reach the city of Palma. And the coast of Palma is home to Mozambique's fledgling natural gas industry. This industry was completely disrupted during the militant offensive in 2001, which just made clearly evident to the foreign investors working in that area that they could no longer count on the Mozambican government to ensure their safety, to ensure their security, and to ensure the sustainable operations of their facilities here off the coast of Mozambique. The one or two foreign companies who are exploring drilling options here off the coast of Mozambique in turn pulled out of the country and surrendered their land back to the armed forces. During my time in Beira, I spoke with a Zimbabwean man who was working as an oil worker off the coast of Bemba during the time of the ISIS capture of the town. He told me that following the escalation of the security situation with ISIS here in Mozambique, he could no longer defend his decision to remain along the coast in northern Mozambique and continue his oil work. And that's just one example of a life which was uprooted due to the insurgency here in Palma and the neglect of the Mozambican government to see the signs of militant uprising here in Cabo Delgado province. Now this is one of those conflicts in which both sides see themselves as the victors. You have the ISIS-linked militants celebrating their capture of a town and even if they ruled it for a couple days before it was recaptured, that's a win for them. They celebrate the departure of foreign companies from Mozambique as another victory. And they celebrate the ongoing small raids which take place in villages not too far from here until today as signs of victory and ongoing successes here in Mozambique. Meanwhile, the government maintains that it also won this conflict, which hasn't ended. It maintains that security forces recaptured Palma quickly and efficiently from the militants and maintains that it has been able to defend other similar towns from capture by militants thereafter. But this isn't just one episode in recent history in which the militants were able to take control from government forces. ISIS-linked militants were only able to capture any territory or launch any raids here in northern Mozambique because of government inability to provide services provide infrastructure to this part of the country. If you travel around the country from south to north, it will become very, very quickly apparent to you that the wealth, the infrastructure, the investments are concentrated in the south of the country. Maputo is nothing like Pemba. It's nothing like any of the inland areas we pass through while traveling on the buses here. It's nothing like the small villages. It's nothing like the small towns. It's nothing like the north coast here in Pemba. So the narrative is very much similar to many other conflicts. When people feel disenfranchised, when they feel forgotten by their authorities, when they feel that they no longer belong as part of the state or that the state is not doing its best to support them, but is doing everything to extract resources from the wealth of their lands, such as the natural gas not too far from here in Cabo Delgado province, you have bits of insurgency which, which, which start. And it's very easy for movements like ISIS to gain a foothold in these communities where people feel alienated, they feel forgotten, they feel like they have no other opportunities, and they feel like there must be something else much larger out there to, to fight for, literally. There's still so much debate in the security community over whether the militants here in Cabo Delgado province are actually ISIS, as in attached to ISIS Central, or not. The important thing is that wherever we go, wherever we find rebellion, or uprising, insurgency, we see patterns. And if we notice these patterns, we can try to avoid 
the atrocities which come from neglecting them. So enough about that. Right now I'm on Wimby Beach and normally this would be a pretty popular tourist destination. However, right now, even though it's almost Christmas, it feels pretty quiet here. There are so many bars and restaurants that way. There are some villas right behind me and everything looks pretty quiet and empty. And I can't help but think that that's because of just the bad press that this area has gotten recently due to, again, the militancy. I'm just roaming the beach right now trying to take it in because everywhere you go, the beach culture is very, very different. So right now you have some women, looks like they're trying to gather fish with a very large net, just taking it sh into shallow parts of the water right now, cast a large net and see what they pick up. Well, I'm absolutely not kidding when I say that my place is just a five minute walk from the airport. This might be the first time in all my travels that I've actually been able to just walk to the airport. <laughs> I think I'm pretty much just sick of every form of public transportation I've taken in Mozambique from the simplest motorcycle taxi to an auto rickshaw to a regular taxi to a minibus to a proper bus to, I don't know, a boat. I took a boat at one point. So after all those experiences, it serves me right that I just found a spot a five minute walk away from the airport and here I'm at the junction right in front of the airport. There's no way I was going to let another taxi ride or bus ride get in between me and getting out of Mozambique. But today I'll be taking the national carrier LAM from Pemba to Dar es Salaam. But this flight doesn't actually start here in Pemba, it's coming from Maputo. Maputo and then pick up and drop off in here in Pemba and then go onward internationally to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I just checked into my flight and this airport is such a vibe just because it doesn't feel like a normal airport. The fact that it's right in the middle of town, anyone can just walk right up to it. You can walk inside, no one's checking for documents or anything. So it feels much more like a train station would or a metro station would in a city. There are people hanging out outside, there are people just walking in. There are more people here in the airport waiting for the ATM, it seems, than actually trying to fly. There's just this one spot for food and drink up here. So I got something to drink and then I'm getting a little meal before I head out. Wow. 